Urban legends are mostly just that, the stuff of legends. They can inspire some people to do horrifying things and create urban legends of their own. Very often, these stories get the movie or show treatment, whether they hew close to anything factual or not. One of the most famous examples of this is Urban Legend, which has a serial killer acting out some of the most famously told tales. Often movies that use the inspired by tag don't have much to do with their source material, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre being merely inspired by Ed Gein. What happens when a legend inspires a movie and then the real story comes out years later? Cropsy was a Staten Island folktale that made the round scaring kids, and a camping variation of it inspired a five-page treatment that would become the cult classic 1981 film The Burning. While it was inspired by folklore, how much did it end up mirroring a real convicted criminal? Don't look in any abandoned rafts as we find out what really happened to The Burning. At the turn of the 1980s, Harvey Weinstein was looking to get his foot in the door in the movie business, and he and his producing partner Michael Cole were looking at horror as their key. Low-budget horror like John Carpenter's Halloween and Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre were wild successes, and so when Weinstein recounted the urban legend of the Cropsey Killer to Cole, he thought it would make a great movie. The five-page treatment was turned into a script by Harvey's brother Bob and Peter Lawrence, and it actually had an effect on two other movies. With it being called The Burning, it forced a title change for another movie with that title, now being called Don't Go in the House, one of my personal favorites on the video nasty list. If you know the plot of Don't Go in the House, it actually makes more sense to be called The Burning. Madman had to change its story around completely and would be pushed from 1981 to a 1982 release. Weinstein would only be a writer for one other movie, playing for keeps in 1986, but of course he would go on to have one of the most successful production companies of all time, and unfortunately have his name tainted forever by controversy. The other writer on the film, Peter Lawrence, would have a much longer writing career, especially in the realm of TV. He would write a ton of episodes for kids' cartoons like Thundercats, Peter Pan and the Pirates, and the 90s iteration of Johnny Quest. Director Tony Milam was chosen based on some of his concert films, and we have a long career after, highlighted by the action sci-fi classic Split Second starring Rutger Hauer. The other behind-the-scenes talent of note are composer Rick Wakerman of the band Yes doing the score, editor Jack Shoulder, who would go on to a nice directing career of his own, and makeup effects master Tom Savini, who turned down Friday the 13th Part 2 to work on The Burning. In front of the camera is an odd collection of talent that includes TV and stage royalty, as well as an Oscar winner. You have Ned Eisenberg, Leah Ayers, and Larry Joshua, who are all dependable character actors, but also Fisher Stevens, Holly Hunter in a Blink and You'll Miss It part, and Jason Alexander. That's an interesting group of people who didn't do a lot of horror before or after. It's the only horror for Stevens besides one episode of the late 90s anthology The Hunger. Alexander did a few more with a couple of very small roles in forgettable horror movies, but he also did an episode of the early 2000s Twilight Zone. That's the Forrest Whitaker hosted one, and was in a minor role in the all-time great Jacob's Ladder. Hunter didn't do much horror either, though she did make Copycat, which came out in the mid-90s glut of thrillers. The movie opens with some of the kids of Camp Blackfoot plotting to play a trick on Cropsey, who's the camp janitor of sorts, and apparently a bit of a bully to some of the kids who have been getting away with transgressions for years. They're tired of him having no punishment, and they place a disgusting skull with maggots near his bed, and when he wakes up, it scares him so much that he knocks over flammable liquid, which also ignites him, his bed, and his whole cabin. Cropsey stumbles out of the cabin and is eventually taken to the hospital, where after five years of failed skin grafts and treatment, he's released to the streets, where he promptly kills his first victim, a prostitute who is willing to sleep with him, at least before she sees him without his hat and wrappings. Okay, in my notes to the editor, I'm giving this a 10% on our factometer scale, and if I'm being honest, not only may that be a little bit high, it's probably going to be a high point of discussing this movie with the urban legend and true story that it's based on. First and foremost, they use the name Cropsey, which is what the actual name of the urban legend that Weinstein based his draft off of was. He was supposedly the boogeyman of Staten Island that children were taught to fear. They were told that if they were bad or went out too late at night, Cropsey would take them to his endless abandoned tunnel system under an old sanatorium. He was an escaped mental patient who allegedly had a hook for a hand, and the sanitarium he dwelled under was a former tuberculosis hospital. Some of the variations had him scarred from a fire, so points there too, and others were about a man who went crazy after his son died. The origin seemed to start in the early 70s after some real-life kidnappings occurred. 
The movie moves us over to Camp Stonewater, where we get a new set of kids and camp counselors doing camp stuff. During a camp baseball game, we see that Cropsey is at the camp and ready to take out some of the unsuspecting kids. We follow them through normal camp shenanigans, discussing sex, goofing off, and enjoying the camp life. There are relationship dynamics, bullies, and counselors that don't really know what's going on. If you caught this chunk of the movie without context, it could seem like a version of Porky's or a ripoff of a John Hughes movie. A bunch of kids go on an overnight trip in canoes, and at night they tell the story of Cropsey. The whole thing is set up like Friday the 13th Part 2, or later Madman, and the tale is exactly what we saw with some of his crimes mixed in for good measure. Of course, they embellish some of him screaming out that he'll have revenge and that he's still out there to feed. The obligatory jump scare then ends the evening. Well, there isn't a lot left here based on anything real, so we should probably jump into what turned out to be the real crop scene. Frank Rostam Rushan was born on March 11, 1944. He and his sister grew up mostly without a father as the man died when Frank was just 14, and according to his sister in the 2009 documentary Cropsey, neither were abused in any way by the father before he died or the mother. The mother was later institutionalized, and the siblings would often visit her. While there was no abuse there, that's certainly a hard and traumatic childhood. Frank kept many jobs, including custodian, hey, that's kind of like the movie, an orderly and therapy aide for the Staten Island Therapy Center. While he never terrorized a camp, his criminal activity started when he was about 25. A couple of the overnight crew go swimming, but cancel before things get too hot and heavy, and the boy leaves his girlfriend alone in the lake. This is where Cropsey takes his first camp victim, and comes quite a bit after his first one when he left the hospital. The next morning, the boyfriend is accused of something nefarious when his girlfriend and all the canoes go missing. They decide to send a small party on a handmade raft back to the main camp to get help. This turns fatal when the group comes across one of the canoes only to be brutally murdered in the film's most famous set piece. Cropsey uses his signature shears and cuts off fingers, slices foreheads, impales teens, and generally causes a pretty bad time. After that, he doubles back and kills two other people who snuck off to have sex in the woods. Again, nothing to see here in terms of the truth. While the slayings are stylized, brutal, and horrible in the movie, in real life, Frank was a special kind of monster. He was first arrested for trying to sexually assault a nine-year-old when a police officer found them both naked in his car. He pleaded guilty to the charge and served 16 months of his four-year sentence. When he got out, he legally changed his name to Andre Rand, but would continue his bad streak with admittedly more minor crimes like burglary. He would make many more questionable choices between 1972 and 1987, and would be in and out of both trouble and prison multiple times during that period. The movie has bodies being found, including the raft massacre, and the head of the camp being notified to get the authorities. While that's happening, two of the remaining people, Todd and Alfred, are stuck being hunted by Cropsey. They're chased around an abandoned part of the camp before Cropsey takes Alfred inside of an old mine shaft. He pins him to the wall before Todd comes in to save him. Armed with an axe, he goes up against a flamethrower-wielding Cropsey, who looks for the perfect revenge as Todd is revealed to be one of the campers who pranked him on that fateful day. The two guys are able to use a combination of the axe, flamethrower, and his own shears to take Cropsey out, and the burning body fades into a campfire where his legend is told all over again to a new set of campers. That last bit of the story where the tale is told to the next generation is a great nod to what the Cropsey legend began as, a cautionary tale of a monster. But the rest was all made up. Rand was eventually confirmed to have killed two victims and suspected of more than five others. Sadly, many of these were younger children, and he has spoken at length about his sexual assaults of all his victims. Police think that he may have been involved in a satanic cult type of situation with sacrificing of young children, and that's why they targeted them. He's currently serving a sentence of 25 years to life, but could be paroled at the age of 93. The movie is a classic for a reason. Once it gets going, it has all those essential slasher elements we've come to know and love. For an in-depth review of the movie itself, check out The Boys at Movie Dumpster on YouTube. If you want to see a chilling and interesting documentary on both the man and the urban legend, check out Cropsey from 2009. The movie isn't really anything like the real story, but does a great job setting up a camp-based urban legend, perfect for what it was initially based off of. Don't move. You're dead!